So we've talked about what is inside of a prokaryote. Let's take a look at what is on the outside. So as you go uh, outside from the cell membrane, the first thing that you're going to encounter is the cell wall. And this is probably, um, I don't want to say that it's the most important uh, structure of the bacterial cell, um, but it's probably the one that is most important for you on the upcoming exam. Because there are so many things that we use the cell wall to test for. Uh, now, in bacteria, like and, and honestly, this is prokaryotic external structures, but really what we're going to be talking about is bacterial external structures. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about archaea in this section, um, but uh, the uh, for bacteria... The cell walls come in two broad categories. There are a couple of variations on these, uh, but these are the two big categories that you need to know right now. Um, and those are gram-positive cell walls and gram-negative cell walls. And I'll get in a moment uh, to talking about what it is that makes those difference. But both of these cell walls have some traits in common. Uh, specifically, they contain a layer of what's called peptidoglycan. And peptidoglycan is a specific arrangement of sugar and peptides. Hence, peptido, peptide, glycan. Anytime you see gly or glue, you should think sugar. So, uh, gram-positive cell walls. Uh, gram-positive cell walls are, I don't want to say the more common, uh, but they are a bit simpler. Uh, for gram-positive cell walls, you have a, the membrane, and don't get the membrane and the wall confused. Totally different things, found next to each other, sometimes integrated with each other, but they are very, very different. The membrane is made out of uh, lipids primarily, whereas the cell wall is made out of peptidoglycan. But I digress. Um, in a gram-positive cell, you have uh, the, the, the membrane, and then right outside of the membrane, you have a thick, multi-layered cell wall. And this cell wall is made out of sheets of peptidoglycan. Uh, peptidoglycan is naturally kind of like flat, like a sheet. And there are many, many layers stacked on top of each other. Like maybe up to 80 layers. Stacked one on top of another, on top of another, on top of another, on top of another, on top, on top, on top, on top. Right? And that's what makes the, um, uh, the, the gram-positive gram-positive, or at least it's one of the major things that does. Um, there's a few other things to keep in mind. Uh, so there are things embedded within this, uh, this multi-layer structure. So think about, like, a big sandwich right so like let's say you've got a sandwich you got like your lower slice of bread and then you put down like cheese and then meat and then maybe a couple more layers of meat and maybe a different type of cheese all right and some lettuce and then maybe a couple of tomatoes on top And, um, you know, then you've got your bun up at the top, right? And you try to pick this sandwich up to eat it. You know, what's going to happen? Well, what's going to happen is, like, you're going to pick it up and squish it. And, like, all these insides are going to just go bleep. 
all that. So what when you get a sandwich like that, what does it have in it? it has a toothpick. Sticking down through it to keep all of the layers lined up. And there's a similar thing going on with gram positive cell walls. They have all of these layers stacked one on top of another, and you don't want them to just go sliding around any which direction. Uh, you want something that's going to keep them anchored together. And the molecule that does this, that functions as the toothpick here, is called tocoic acid and lipo tocoic acid. Uh, technically, so tocoic acids go partially through. So they're toothpicks that don't quite go all the way down. And the lipotocoic acids are toothpicks that go all the way through and then embed in the membrane. That's the lipo part, is that it's attached to the lipids in the membrane. So uh, the the tocoic acid is just going to keep the, the layers lined up with each other. The lipotocoic acid is going to do that, but it's also going to keep the layers anchored to the membrane itself. Um, Gram-negative cell walls, on the other hand, uh, are much more flexible in structure. Gram-positive cell walls have all of those layers of, of rigid cell wall material, so they're very stiff. Gram-negative cell walls are a bit more complicated, um, and they're also a lot more flexible. So here what we have is, again, we have our, um, our cell membrane, and then we have usually a thin layer of peptidoglycan. Uh, it's still going to have like multiple sheets, but we're talking like, you know, like maybe four um, or eight instead of 80 layers. So you're just going to have a few layers of peptidoglycan here. So that's going to make it a lot uh, less stiff, a lot more flexible. Um, but we're going to also have another structure, and that is an outer membrane. So since you only have, like, just, just basically a couple of layers here, you don't really need a toothpick to hold them together, but you've got this outer membrane called the outer membrane, um, and the outer membrane is sort of similar to the inner membrane, like they're both made out of membrane lipids, but the outer membrane has some very specific special structures in it. Uh, one of them are porins. As you might guess from the name, porins are big holes. They're basically proteins, uh, these big protein complexes that just make a hole in the membrane. Um, so we say that this outer membrane is porous meaning things can go out very easily and things can go in very easily as well, as long as they're relatively small, right? So uh, most proteins, uh, nutrient molecules, ions, water, um, things like that have no problem going in or out. Uh, so the outer membrane doesn't do an awesome job of being a barrier. It'll keep like really huge things out, like other cells or, um, uh, you know, maybe virus particles or, you know, something huge like that. Uh, but, you know, for m most things you're going to encounter, they can get in and out through the pores. So this is a porous membrane. Uh, the other thing is the outer layer, right? Not just the outer membrane, but the outside facing side of the outer membrane has special molecules embedded in it. Um, what are called lipopolysaccharides 
or LPS. Uh, these LPSs are um, complicated molecules. They've got a lipid portion that is embedded in the membrane. That's called lipid A. And then they have a core polysaccharide region. And then they have what's called the O antigen. And the O antigen is going to be uh, variable depending upon the species of bacteria. Uh, you can have different O antigens. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is that generally speaking, Lipopolysaccharide is what we call an endotoxin. So an endotoxin is something which is toxic. It's poisonous, um, but it isn't like it's being pumped out. Uh, this toxin is only released if the cell dies. Uh, if the cell dies, then its outer membrane will fragment off into pieces and uh, will release these LPS fragments. And once they've been released, then they can be very, very toxic. They can cause what's called endotoxic shock. Uh, in endotoxic shock, what basically happens is, um, we'll talk more about it when we talk about toxins and the immune system, uh, but it causes a, a severe immune response. It's what we call a super antigen, uh, meaning it kicks your immune system, your uh, specifically your inflammatory response, into high overdrive. And your inflammatory response can actually damage you if it happens too far too fast. And, and uh, what it causes is uh, it, it, it causes your, um, your capillaries and your uh, um, arteries to dilate and expand, causing a severe drop in blood pressure. Uh, and that drop in blood pressure produces shock. Your heart can no longer pump blood to your brain. You pass out and you might die. Um, it also produces extremely high fever, a uh, fever that's so high it can, uh, it can potentially hurt you. And this is one reason why gram-negative bacteria are particularly fierce pathogens, especially if they are found in your blood. If these endotoxic components get into your blood, um, they produce uh, uh, what, what's called uh, uh, toxemia or um, septicemia. So, um, gram-negative infections, particularly gram-negative blood infections, uh, can actually kill you if you treat them too quickly, right? So let's say that somebody's got a, uh, a gram-negative um, infection, right? They've got a lot of black t bacteria in their blood and you give them a high dose of antibiotics, right? Well, you just killed a whole ton of that gram-negative bacteria, they all die and therefore all release their endotoxins at the same time, and you end up with an endotoxic overload that results in, uh, uh, in endotoxic shock. So um, you can actually kill a patient by trying to treat them uh, if they have a gram-negative infection. That's one reason why those are particularly feared. Uh, the peptidoglycan of the cell wall uh, is constructed in a particular way. Uh, it's woven like a sheet. 
and uh, you have your glycans, your polysaccharide, going all one direction. And then you have your peptides linking them, what we should call cross-linking them, in the other direction. Just like if you take a look at, you know, your sheets or some fabric or something like that, you'll see that it has strands woven in one direction and strands woven in the other direction, and that's what provides it its strength. Um, the sugars that make up the, uh, the, the glycan portion, uh, the sugar backbone, are made out of two sugars. One of them is called NAG, N-A-G, it stands for like N-acetylglycan, I think. And the other one is NAM, which stands for uh, something else. You don't need to know what they stand for, right? You just need to know NAG and NAM. And they alternate. So each of these strands is built NAG, NAM, NAG, NAM, NAG, NAM, back and forth, right? And then the strands are cross-linked together by these peptides. Uh, and what you actually have is, um, uh, you have a tetrapeptide cross bridge, and then you have a connecting chain of amino acids that link these tetrapeptides together. So it's not a full protein, but it is what we call a polypeptide. Now, why is the cell wall so important? Well, there are actually lots of reasons why the cell wall is so important. Um, for one, um, it is, uh, like, it's really sort of essential to the cell's function, and it's a thing that we target with antibiotics. There are antibiotics that go and destroy the cell wall, and that's how they get rid of the uh, bacteria. Um, but probably the reason that's most immediately relevant is this division into gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria occurred very early in bacterial evolution. So, like, about half-ish of the bacteria out there are gram-positive, about half are gram-negative. You got some oddballs that don't really fit into either camp. But most of those oddballs are not human pathogens. There are a few that are, uh, but most of them are not human pathogens, and so we're not going to worry too much about them. When you get an unknown bacteria, say somebody comes in and they have a, a throat swab, right? They say they have a, 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 a throat infection, and you determine that it's bacterial because you swab it and you hear some bacteria from it. Uh, the first thing you're going to want to know is, is it gram positive or is it gram negative, right? That's going to be the question that you ask that is going to eliminate half the possibilities. Uh, and we have a great test for doing that. It's something that you will probably be doing in lab very, very soon. It's called the gram stain. It's probably the most frequently performed uh, microbiological test. Uh, and uh, you're going to go over this in pretty heavy detail in lab. Uh, but I want to give you a basic overview. There's essentially four steps in the gram stain. Uh, first, the cells are stained with a stain called crystal violet. As you might guess from the name, it's purple. So this is going to stain all the cells purple. Uh, it's a normal stain. It gets in past the cell wall into the cell itself, and it stains the cell itself. You then add a component called iodine, which is a mordant. Uh, so mordant comes from the same root word as mortar. Uh, and, you know, like if you think of brick and mortar, the mortar is the thing that sticks the bricks together. 
Well, a mordant is an old term for something that sticks a dye to the thing being dyed. Um, it, it's it's what, uh, uh, what makes it so that the dye doesn't come out in the wash or whatever like that. In this case, what's going to happen is that the iodine uh, is going to form a complex with the crystal violet. They're going to chemically react together, and uh, when they do, uh, that's going to make the, the, the dye much larger. So it got in easy. It could pass through the cell wall. It doesn't matter if it's gram positive or gram negative. It passes through the cell wall relatively easy because it's very small. Uh, and then you add the iodine. The iodine gets into the cell, complexes with the crystal violet, and now it's larger. Now it's going to have a much more difficult time getting back out because it's big. Step three is decolorizer, which is usually alcohol or a mixture of alcohol and acetone. Uh, this is going to remove the dye, right? But it's only going to remove the dye from the gram negatives. See, the thing is that the gram negatives have really uh, thin cell walls and um, when you add the decolorizer, the cell walls are thin enough that the dye inside, even though it's complex, it can still get out. Uh, but in the gram-positive cell walls, the decolorizer actually dehydrates the cells and it causes the, um, the cell wall to, to sort of shrink and tighten up. Kind of like if you wash wool clothes on on high heat uh, in the, you know, in, in your washer. Um, and uh, when, it, when it causes them to shrink because they've been dehydrated, their holes get smaller. And the fact that the holes in the gram positive get smaller combined with the fact that the dye is now larger because of the mordant means that the dye gets trapped inside gram positive cell walls. So at this point, the gram negatives are clear because there's nothing holding the dye in there, but the gram positives remain purple. You still want to be able to see the gram negative cells, so you add in step four a counter stain, safrinin, which is a reddish pink dye, and it will actually stain both of the cells, but it's like it's like it's pink, right? If you got so if if you if you've got like if you're wearing a black shirt and you spill some coffee on it, it's kind of hard to see. If you're wearing a white shirt and you spill some coffee on it, it's totally obvious. So these these clear cells are going to get the pink dye and it's going to show right through, very very clear. The purple cells are going to get the pink dye and it's like purple's already darker than pink, so it isn't going to you're not going to be able to see it. And here you can see some cells that have been gram stained. So you can see these circular cells that are purple. Uh, those are... Uh, looks like they might be a type of strep bacteria. Uh, they're definitely gram positive. And you can see these uh, short rods, probably E. coli. Uh, that are pink. And this is like once you know how to do it, it's a very fast test to do. If you've got a sufficient quantity of bacteria, this thing takes like eh, five minutes. Um, and this is just goes through what I just talked about here, right? So in gram positive, you have the iodine violet complex, which is larger. Um, you hit the cell with the decolorizer. That's going to disrupt the membranes, um, but it's also going to dehydrate the cell and shrink the thick layer of peptidoglycan, which is going to trap these dye complexes inside. In a gram-negative cell, um, you still have the, the crystal violet iodine complex, when you hit it with the decolorizer, it's going to burst the outer membrane. 
um, and it's going to fragment the inner membrane, but you only have just a very few uh, layers here, not enough to actually shrink. And so when it dehydrates the cell, uh, the water that gets pulled out is going to carry the dye with it. Uh, and here, this is uh, just going over what I was talking about earlier. Um, lipopolysaccharide, or LPS, is medically important. Um, it is an endotoxin, uh, specifically the lipid A portion is the endotoxic element. The O antigen is the, uh, the portion that, we, uh, that is different in every species, right? Or in different strains of the same species. So the O antigen, which is the outer part of the LPS, is actually what we detect if we are doing, like if you're doing a, um, an antibody-based test for, uh, to figure out what strain of bacteria something is, you're probably detecting what the O antigen is. And that's something that can really only be done on gram negatives because gram positives don't have O antigens. All right, past cell walls, or actually right before cell walls, uh, cell membranes. And cell membranes are technically not in or out of the cell. They are the boundary between the inside and the outside of the cell. Um, I'm not gonna say a whole lot about this other than that the cell membranes of bacteria uh, are, if we're talking about the cytoplasmic membrane, uh, are very similar to the cytoplasmic membrane of eukaryotes and everything else. So if you've had introbio, or you can, you, you know basically kind of how this works, uh, they're made of phospholipids, uh, which have hydrophobic tails and hydrophilic head groups. The hydrophobic tails orient towards each other uh, so that they can exclude water because they don't like to be near water. And the hydrophilic head groups, which are charged, orient themselves facing towards the water. So you've got like, you know, a lot of water out here, a lot of water in here, but no water in the middle of the membrane. Um, it is sort of flexible. It's kind of like basically a, a soap bubble, you can kind of think of it as. Uh, and it follows what we call the fluid mosaic model. So this is basically like an intact sheet, but things within the sheet can move around. So for instance, this particular lipid here, it could move this way, whereas this lipid at the same time could be moving the opposite direction. Uh, so they can move side to side to side to side really easily, um, but it's very difficult for them to flip or to leave. Uh, similarly, these proteins, and there are a bunch of proteins embedded in the membrane. It's actually by mass about 50% protein. These proteins can also float side to side fairly freely, although they do so much slower than the lipids do. We also describe the membrane as being selectively permeable, meaning some things can get through very easily and some things can't. Specifically, this, the inside of this membrane is very hydrophobic, water-fearing. So things which are hydrophobic, like lipids and certain organic molecules, can easily pass through without any assistance. Things which are hydrophilic or water loving they 
can't pass through the hydrophobic core. Um, they can only get through if there is a special pore or gate molecule that lets them in. So by being selectively permeable, the membrane and the cell that owns it can control what goes in and out of the cell. Moving on, the flagella. Uh, the flagella is the most common bacteria motility structure. There are a few other ones, but they're pretty rare, and I'm not going to really talk about them too much right now. Um, the bacterial flagella, by the way, is totally different from the eukaryotic flagella. Uh, flagella is just a Latin word that means whip, and it it looked like it had this little whippy tail, so that's what they called it. And then there were also eukaryotes that looked like they had a little whippy tail, so they called those flagella too. And then later on, we figured out that these two things are totally and completely unrelated other than the fact that they both kind of look like whippy tails. The way that the, <coughs> that the bacterial flagella works is it's a flexible protein whip. Um, it's embedded in the membrane and then there's a hook after it emerges from the membrane and um, it works basically like a propeller, right? When the cell is moving, this, this uh, entire structure just like spins in a big circle. Woo, 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 woo. And that causes the, uh, the, the big whippy tail to make this sort of corkscrew looking thing. And that corkscrew Basically, the propeller is going to push the cell through the water. Now, um, being able to move is cool and all, but if you don't have any way to tell where you're going, then moving is not all that useful. So how do bacteria know where they're going? Bacteria don't have eyes. Bacteria don't have ears. So how do they know if they're running towards food or towards death? Um, or do they just go randomly? And actually, like, it kind of looks like they move randomly, but it's a little bit less randomly than you might think. There is basically one sense that bacteria have. They can kind of smell. And by smell, what I mean is that they can detect the concentration of certain chemicals, usually food chemicals, but sometimes toxin chemicals as well, or danger chemicals. So say that you start with a, um, a bacteria up here, right? And uh, let's put a food source down here. Well, the bacteria runs in a, it moves in what's called a run and tumble movement motif. Um, and that means that It starts moving in basically a random direction. So let's say it starts moving this way and runs there. And so it runs, it basically just swims a direction, a random direction for some amount of time. And then it goes bring, and its flagella just go off in random directions. And it starts spinning or tumbling. And uh, while it's, it, it, it eventually gets done spinning, and then it'll start running whatever direction it's pointing. Right? And it'll run for some time and then it'll start tumbling again. And then it'll go off in a different direction.
and then it'll start tumbling again. And then it'll run off in a different direction again. And then it'll start tumbling again. And it'll run off in a different direction. And so it looks like it's just moving randomly. But if you watch it happen, even though the bacteria seems to be just moving random directions, if you look at it for more than a few seconds, it'll end up where the food is. So if it's just like gonna tumble in a random direction and then zip off that way and then tumble again and then zip off in another random direction, how does it end up where the food is? Well, the one sense that they have is that they can tell whether the scent that they're following is getting stronger or weaker. And if the scent is getting stronger, then they run further. If the scent is getting weaker, then they run less far and tumble more often. So if you look at this pattern that I sort of drew here, you see when it's like running parallel, not getting closer, not really getting further away, it runs sort of a medium distance. When it's running towards the food, it runs longer. When it's moving away, it runs shorter and is moving away again and it runs shorter. And then it's moving mostly kind of towards-ish the food. And so it runs longer. And then it runs away, that's shorter, and then it's running towards the food and it runs longer. So even though the direction that it ends up pointing is always random, it still kind of can control which direction it's moving. Sort of. That's what we call run and tumble. All right. Continuing to move out, glycocalyces. Glycocalyces are um, layers found outside of the cell, outside of the cell membrane, outside of the cell wall. So they're coating the cell. And they are made out of a starchy mucus. When you mix starch and water, what you get is a mucus of some sort or another. And uh, basically, it's mucus. It's, it's snot, right? And, uh, you know, some snot is thicker. Some snot is, like, gooier. It tends to be pretty snicky. Snicky? It's, it's snot. Um, there's two general types of glycocalyces. Glycocalyx, calyx, by the way, just means sugar coating. It's starch, but starch is just a polysaccharide of sugars. Um, but there are capsules and slime layers. Uh, capsules are generally, they're a bit thicker, um, and they're usually pretty clear which bacteria owns which capsule. They, they aren't quite fluid enough that they just blend with each other. So. Here we see a bacteria with a uh, capsule surrounding it. And this capsule is a thick mucus, does two main things for it. First off, uh, it's sticky. So it helps to stick the bacteria to surfaces. Um, and that can help the bacteria to establish colonies, right? If a bacteria is just floating around in water, then every time it like replicates, now you have two bacteria, but they don't stay together. They're just both floating around in the water. But if it's stuck to a surface, then they can kind of like start to form colonies and build up their numbers. The second thing that capsules do is they provide a camouflage. Right? 
So if we're talking about your immune system, or even if we're talking about some sort of other bacteria or other microorganism that's hunting down this bacteria, the way they recognize it is by looking at the proteins and uh, other antigens, like the O antigens that we talked about before, that are on the surface. Well, what this uh, glycocalyx does is it just like coats the whole thing in slime. And mucus is a relatively neutral substance. It, it, it isn't super easy to recognize. So just it's just coated with mucus and anything that touches it is just gonna go, all right, that's mucus, whatever. Um, like I, I, I'm, a, I'm a child of the 80s. Famous movie in the 80s is uh, Predator, and like there's this cool scene in it. Like the Predator sees like heat signatures, and like guy needs to sneak past the Predator. It's been a while since I've seen it, but uh, guy needs to sneak past the Predator, and he needs he he knows that the Predator can see his heat, so he like coats himself in mud so that he's the same temperature as the ground around him. Um, and like sneaks past it by this this mud coating that's on him, and I, I like to think of the the capsule is working kind of like that. It's this snot coating that makes the bacteria look kind of like everything else that's coated with snot. Um, the other uh, type of glycocalyx is what's called a slime layer, um, and slime layers group. Uh, they're usually a little bit more runny. Uh, and a little bit more um, liquidish than capsules are, uh, so that like if you have a whole bunch of bacteria in a slime layer, you can't exactly tell where one glycocalyx stops and the other one starts. You basically just got a bunch of bacteria that they're all in slime. Um, this is very useful for clumping cells together into a mass and is specifically involved in biofilm formation. And biofilms are something that uh, we'll talk about at a later time, but it's an alternate lifestyle where bacteria can basically start to live in specialized colonies and um, they aren't really a multicellular organism, but they start to adopt different roles and begin helping each other out. So those are the two main types of glycocalyces. Uh, and you can, uh, just like you can stain cell walls, you can stain for capsules, sort of, right? Here's the thing, mucus is very neutral and stains don't like to stick to it. So like you can stain for cell walls because you can just make a stain that binds to the cell wall. You can stain for cell membranes because you can make a stain that binds to the cell membrane. Well, it's very difficult to make a stain that binds to a capsule. So how can you tell if a capsule is there? You take advantage of the fact that stains don't like to stick to it and you stain everything else. So like you put a stain on the background of your slide and then you have another stain um, that like will stain the inside of the cell and then the capsule is visible because it's where the stain isn't. It's the only thing that doesn't stain. Um, so you can kind of see it by where the ink or the stain is not. And capsules are very important medically. Uh, remember how I said that, that it acts as a camouflage and a colonizing agent? Well, uh, while those do protect it in the environment, they also protect it in your body. They are what we call virulence factors. This is an important term that we're going to be talking about later on. But to give you... Uh, the basics of it, a virulence factor is a genetic or morphological trait that makes a bacteria into a better pathogen. Uh, the more virulence factors that a uh, bacteria has, the more likely it is to be able to cause disease 
and to be able to cause serious or fatal disease. So obviously we are interested in things that are virulence factors, and we want to be able to like test for them, and understand them. <clears throat> Just to give you an example, all right? Streptococcus pneumoniae is a human pathogen. It's a common bacteria. It's actually found in a lot of people. Many people have native populations of Streptococcus pneumoniae. As you might guess from the name, it is also capable of causing human disease. It can cause pneumonia. Uh, some people have strep pneumonia and they don't have pneumonia. Some people have it and they do get pneumonia. So um, what's the difference? Well, some of it has to do with the individual uh, uh, immune systems of the person, but some of it also has to do with what strain of strep pneumonia you have. There are lots of different strains of strep pneumonia, but I'm going to take two um, of the earliest ones that were uh, discovered. So there was, for instance, a very early experiment where they said, okay, we've got two strains of strep pneumonia. They're the same bacteria, the same species of bacteria, but they've got some genetic differences. And one of them was called the R strain for rough, because when you looked at them under the microscope, they had kind of like rough edges and they made these small colonies. Uh, and then there was the smooth strain, because when you looked at them under the microscope, they had a very smooth appearance and they made these larger, smoother colonies. Well, here's the thing. If you take a mouse, and you inject it with the rough strain of strep pneumonia, it like, I mean, it doesn't have a great time, but it's probably gonna get better, right? It, it's gonna get a fever for a little bit of time and then it's gonna get better, as most of them are gonna live. Um, take the same mouse and inject it with the smooth strain, they die. Almost 100% of them are going to die. Now, these are the same species of bacteria. The only difference is the, the S factor, the, the genetic factor that makes them smooth. All right? So that one thing makes the difference between something that doesn't kill you and something that does. And what is the difference between these two? It's a capsule. The rough strain don't have a capsule. That's why they look rough. The, the, the smooth strain do have a capsule. Uh, that's why they look larger. That's why they form these larger, smooth colonies. So the presence or absence of a capsule can make the difference between like a bacteria that's inconvenient and a bacteria that's deadly. Uh, last thing that I want to talk about here are fimbria and pili. These are protein projections. Uh, they look kind of like hair, um, but they aren't. So here you can see some bacteria and they have like these long flagella coming off. Flagella are motility structures. They're what gets the bacteria around. Then there are these smaller spikes coming off. Those are fimbria. Fimbria are um, not motility structures. They don't move. Um, they, they aren't like little legs that it can use to, to move around with. Um, but what they are is uh, they are primarily used for attachment. Each of these fimbria will have a... Um, a little grabby arm at the end of them, often. And that allows them to stick and grab hold of certain surfaces. Because they've got these little grabby arms at the end of the spikes. They're called uh, attachment factors. Right. The other thing is, like, if you've ever gotten, like, slime in your hair 
right? If you get if you get like slime on, on your hands, it's easy to wash off. You get slime in your hair, and it's really, really hard to get it off. So uh, if you have a glycocalyx, like a slime layer or a capsule, well, how do you just keep that thing from just oozing on off? Well, what it, if you have these hair-like projections, fimbriae, they will help to hold your capsule on and in place. So fimbriae are another type of virulence factor. Um, the, the little grabby arms uh, can help them attach and colonize uh, your body so that they can kind of like build up a local advantage by reproducing and staying in the same area. Um, as well as uh, they aid the, the glycocalyx, and the glycocalyx is, of course, also a virulence factor. Uh, pili are special protein spiky things. They're related to fimbria, but are very different in terms of their function. They're usually intermediate in length. They're usually going to be like longer than a fimbria, but um, but shorter than a flagella. And what they are used for is bacteria sex, basically. Um, you could have like two bacteria. And one of them will grow a pili and stick it into the other bacteria. And then it will, it can transfer some genetic material through the pili, which is actually a hollow tube, and inject some of its genetic material into the other bacteria. And then it'll kind of like break off um, but the bacteria will have spread some of its material around and we'll, we'll talk about uh, pili more when we talk about um, bacterial genetics but it is a reproductive structure now an important thing to keep in mind is fimbria and pili and glycocalyces are both optional or all optional some bacteria will have fimbria some won't some will have pili, some won't. Some will have a glycocalyx, some won't. Some will have flagella, some won't. They're all going to have a plasma membrane. You don't have a plasma membrane, you're not a cell. And they're almost all going to have a cell wall. There's like a few bacteria that have managed to get rid of their cell wall, but it's really uncommon. All right. That is the main structures of the prokaryotic cell that I would like you guys to know.